favorite books of all time. It's called Work Out, Deep Water Man. And it was written by a man named Robert McCloskey. You might have heard of him from before. He wrote other books like Make Way for Ducklings. Um, and one of the things that I love about this book is that Robert McCloskey lived on an island in Maine, near where we live. And when I was little, I grew up on an island, too. And this story is about a fisherman. And where I grew up, on the island of Islesboro, there were a lot of fishermen and a lot of characters, just like Bert Chow. And that's why I love it so much. And this book, this particular copy of this book, is my very own copy that was given to me when I was maybe in second grade. So I've, sa I've saved it all these years because I love it so much, so it's pretty old. So I'm going to read it for you. And this, um, one of the other things that's great about this book, it's got awesome pictures in it. So we put together a little slideshow here so you can see the pictures in the book. So, Bert Dow, Deep Water Man. Bert Dow, Deep Water Man. A tale of the sea in the classic tradition. <coughs> Bert Dow is an old deep water man. Retired, of course. But retired or not, he still keeps two, two boats. One is a dory so old and leaky that it can no longer be launched. Bert has painted it red and placed it on a little patch of lawn in front of his house overlooking the bay. He's rigged it up like one of the many ships he's sailed to all the corners of the seven seas. It's filled plumb to the gunnels with air. And every summer, Bert plants it with geraniums and Indian peas. The drain is breaking up the deck, and the Indian teens climb the rigging and sway this away, that away, in a smoky sou'wester. The other boat is an old double ender named the Tidely Idler, with a make and break engine. This boat leaks too, except when it's pulled up on shore for caulking and patching and painting, which is most of the time. She's a good boat, says Barrett, patting her on the stern and giving her propeller an affectionate kick. She's got a few tender places in her planking, but you can't see daylight through her nowhere. Tidy Idle is a pride and a joy in Barrett's life, and between odd jobs for the natives and summer people, he keeps her painted and patched as best as he can. <coughs> Every time he does a paint job, he brings home the leftover paint and uses it on the Tidy Idle. That pink plank, he says, is the color of Ginny Poor's pantry, and the green one is the color of the floors and doors and dark walls and waiting room. And then there's that tan porch and paint and trim color from Captain Haskell's house. Bert Dow has a sister named Leela who keeps house for him and cooks the lobsters and the fish he catches and the clams he digs. She feeds the cock, she feeds the hen, she tends the garden, and she helps Bert keep down the weeds in the dory full of geranium and Indian peat. Leela is a very impatient. Most impatient being on land or sea, says Bert, and he hustles about doing this or that so as not to keep her awake. Mornings when the cock crows, cock doo doo Leela is already down in her kitchen, rattling her stove lids, clinkety clank and shouting, hit the deck, Bert, time to eat! And Bert, winking and blinking his eyelids, comes stumbling down the stairs to breakfast so as not to keep Leela awake. Bert Dow has a giggling gulp for a pet. Every morning, she roosts on the roof of the shed where Bert keeps his fishing gear. The gull giggles, tee hee hee, until Bert comes out and tosses her a pancake or a popover or sometimes a piece of cinnamon toast. When Bert Dow puts out to sea on the tidy idly, everybody in town knows it. They hear him pump out the water that has leaked in overnight, slish, slosh, slish, slosh. Then there's a pause while Bert checks the tenderest spot between the pink plank, the color of Jenny Ford's pantry, and the green plank, the color of the floors and doors and dark walls and waiting room. Then they hear them, him start the make and break engine. Clackety bang, clackety bang. Then they see him, firm hand on the tiller, giggling gulf, lying along behind heading out of the cold and going clackety baggity down the bed. One morning, the cock crowed, cock -a -doo, and Leela rattled her stone lids, clinkety plank, shouting, hit the deck, Bert, time to eat! And Bert came downstairs, winking and blinking his sleepy eyelids, and ate his breakfast. He tossed the giggling gull to pop over, tee hee hee, and went down the cove to pump out the tidy idly, slish the slosh, slish the slosh. 
gently felt the tender plank between, between the pink plank, the color of Jimmy Ford's pantry, and the green plank, the color of the floor of the star walk of Lake. Giggly gull, he said, sadly, won't be long before the tide of the idly gets planted with geraniums and Indian beans. Then he started the making break. Clackety bang, clackety bang. And firm hand on the tiller, giggling gull flying along behind, he headed out of the cold, going clackety bang, and he got on the bed to fish for cod. Bear kept studying the color of the sky, the color of the water, and the direction of the wind. An old deep water man like me always keeps a weather eye out, says Bear. But he keeps two weather eyes out when he puts out to sea in a vessel as old and leaky as the tidely island. It looked like a good day, so Bear took the tidely island way, way out to the end of the bay and into the open sea. He shut off the make break engine and let the boat drift on a gentle swell. And he baited up his hook with clams and lowered it over the side to fish for cod. Bear didn't get any bites, not even a tiny, weeny nibble. So he cranked up the make and break and moved the tide of the ivy to another spot. But there were no fish there either. He didn't even pull up a pollock or a sculpin. Must be down something down there frightening all those fish, he confided to Giggling Gull. Dee 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 dee! Giggling Gull agreed. Then Barrett felt a substantial sort of tug on his line that almost, but not quite, pulled him over the side. Then Barrett pulled, and then Barrett tugged, and he heaved, and he dug, and he grunted, and groaned until the tidy-eyed neglectively stood on it. 